Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Vaginas are absolute magic. And Ollie is here to give them the respect they deserve. That means shame-free supplements made with clinically studied ingredients to keep your pH in check. And your pleasure a priority. Put yourself on top. Go to Ollie.com today. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. I just want to jump in here with a quick note about some changes that are happening. This podcast is now going ad supported. What that means is I will be releasing select episodes from the hundreds of episodes I have archived now on Patreon and releasing them here. A lot of these were recorded a couple of years ago during 2020, especially. However, I have gone through them and deemed that the parenting information was still really relevant. So just be aware that some of these releases may be out of order chronologically. Also, if you would like to listen to the podcast ad-free, you can still join Patreon. I'll still be releasing podcasts there with a few bonuses. One is that it will be ad-free. One will be that you get the podcast slightly earlier than everybody else. And I'll also be doing a bonus episode every month with a Q&A that's patron specific. So if that's something you'd like to do, you can join for a dollar a month and we'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, you guys. So today is slightly different for me. I'm recording midday and Pascal has taken Maverick out for a very long walk. So I will be unencumbered by a barking dog. (laughs) And we just came off the most amazing morning of homeschooling. It was such a, such a parenting win this morning. Pascal has been highly motivated to do a lot of of schoolwork. And now that he's homeschooling high school and has a clear goal, he wants to be a DEM environmental police officer, which requires a biology degree. So he has a very clear focus now. So we're doing a lot more than we've ever done. I have historically unschooled. Well, I guess it's unschooling if it's child directed, right? (laughs) And so we sunk into biology while we're in the middle of his biology textbook. And he had a question that the book didn't seem to answer and I couldn't seem to answer. And we went into the internet and it was a huge question. His question was valid because there were like 9,000 Google pages on this question. And we ended up going down this rabbit hole and it was so juicy. And it's just, I love, I love homeschooling so much. So if you guys have any questions about homeschooling or specifics, I've done a couple of podcast episodes about it, but it's so fun. This question, I feel like would have been totally blown off in school and like, that's how it is. Just don't question it and move on in the sort of rush to get through quantity and not necessarily quality at times. And so anyway, it's just one of those like gratifying mornings where it all went stellar. So I'm in a fabulous mood. So I wanted to bring up a couple of lessons from Maverick. <laughs> In the last episode, I interrupted myself to tell you about how he took off sledding, right? He went to play with the kids who were sledding and I went and got him and I was so mad. I was just so mad that he took off. He He's really like a teenager now, less of a toddler and more of a teenager, I guess. He's really starting to show some uh, some punk ass tendencies. So I was so mad at him. And I, I if you missed the story, We own seven acres and then we're surrounded by state trust. And to the left of my house is a a valley with a vernal pool. And on the other side of that is the best sledding in the county. And so the other day, what was it, Friday, we got a huge snowstorm and we got a foot and a half of snow and we're on a snow belt. So we get more snow than anybody in the state. And so there were kids, you know, it was it was on a Friday that we got the storm. And then Saturday and Sunday, there were just kids 
kids. You could hear them. And sure enough, at one point, it proved to be too much for Maverick. And I usually let him out of the house. Um, he has an e-collar in response to the tone. I usually let him out of the house and he's fine. He sticks pretty close to home. He comes right back when I call him or when I do the tone on the e-collar. And this one morning I was, I let him out and I hadn't heard from him in a while. And so I went out and he wasn't responding. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I have to go grab the keys to my truck. And I go to the sledding because I knew I was like, oh, my God, he took off to be with the kids. So I went over and it was crowded and I go up and I was like, has anybody seen a rambunctious black dog? And she's like, oh, yeah. This one mom's like, yeah, he's down there playing with the kids. And he was having the time of his life. And he just like took it into his own hands to go find where the kids were. So I was so mad. He'd get him in the truck and he was I know a lot of dogs are like this, but Maverick's over the top. Like he's so contrite. He was sitting in the front seat and he was whining and he had his head on me. He was like super sorry. And I was super mad. And I get him back home and he goes right to the ledge of that like valley. He's looking towards the kids again. And I was like, Maverick. And I was so mad. And I was like being mean, you know, I'm not physically, but I was just like, get in the house. I was just being bitchy in my tone. And he was ignoring me. And then he kept walking away from me. And I had this moment where I was like, well, of course he's not responding to you, Jamie. You're being a bitch. And immediately I was like, come here, buddy. I, I'm sorry. You know, and he came right to me. I was like, come on, let's go in the house. And I just turned my demeanor around. And then we get in the house and I give a lecture to my dog about taking off and going to play with the kids. You guys, I gave a lecture to a dog. That's the stupidest thing. Then it occurs to me that he is not getting it. That was so long ago. That was so eight minutes ago. And the parallel, of course, is number one, if you're being bitchy to your kids, they're not going to respond to you. You know, yeah, if we go to DEF CON 5 with our yelling, chances are they're going to listen, but they're going to listen out of fear. But it, if we approach their bad behavior, at least with some niceness in our voice, we're going to get a better response. And I also thought of you guys because kids and dogs, you know, your average three-year-old has the same brain as your average dog. Now, of course, we have more complexity and we go quickly beyond the dog. But I was thinking about you guys because there's no use staying mad. There's no use staying mad. And there's certainly no use giving a lecture. They're just going to hear blah, 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 Maverick. Right? <laughs> and it was so long ago in their brain development, whatever they did, and 10 minutes later, you're still on it. They have forgotten about it. They don't even know what you're pissed about. So anyway, that was one lesson from Maverick this week. And then the next one is we go for like three or four miles every morning. And we do these trails that are near my house. And somehow we've gotten into this habit of I bring a little package of treats, just kibble. And just whenever he wants it, he stands in front of me and he gets a little, you know, little handful of kibble. And it's like a snack. It's not a treat. It's not for good behavior. It's just a snack. And I'm like, he's a dog. He's a growing dog. He needs snacks. But lately, what happens is the minute he takes that handful, so he can go, he'll go like a mile before he remembers that I have snacks. But then what will happen is he'll stop me every like 10 feet for a snack. And it irritates me because he's not doing the dog thing that he's supposed to do. He gets this amazing barreling run, especially now that there's snow on the ground. He loves the snow and he will run hard and he will play and he'll go down by the water. And right now he's like investigating the ice and you know, he's doing the dog thing. He's doing the thing that we're outside to do, which is run your ass off so you get tired, so you work your dog muscles, right? But he gets obsessed with the snacks. And I have seen this on the playground. I have seen kids get so snack focused that they don't do the kid thing they're supposed to do, which is play on the playground. So the parallel there for you guys is like, be careful that you're not over snacking your child, especially in those places where they're supposed to be doing the thing that you brought them to do, right? Which is like, move those muscles, move that body, let's play. Because I've literally seen this out in my own community where the kids are just like hovering by the mom for the goldfish or the Cheerios or whatever's in the bag and they're not doing the kid thing. So sometimes it might be good to like, I don't know, forget the snacks. And so that's what I've been doing is I've been forgetting the snacks. I have to show my empty hands like a blackjack dealer, be like, Mav, I don't have anything. And then he goes and plays. So just something to be aware of, like, is your kid over snacked to the point that they're snack obsessed and not doing their kid thing? <laughs> 
All right. Next up is a personal story after Dr. Rimka, that interview, which is just my favorite interview ever. I just love her. I got up the nerve to finally cold plunge. So I take cold showers. And when I am involved in some obstacle course racing, there are often times where I have to swim through like a freezing cold mountain lake or something like that. But I've never done a cold plunge just for the sake of biohacking or just because it's good for me. So I finally cold plunged after I did a sauna. And I got to tell you guys, it was unbelievable. First of all, it was like 40 degrees, the water. And I thought it would just take my breath away. And it didn't. I just stayed super calm. I plunged. I stayed in for three and a half minutes, which I never in my life thought I could do. And when I tell you, I was like high for two good hours and I wasn't freezing. It amazes me. I stayed super calm. And if you listen to the interview with Dr. Rimka, I did this like really big breath when I got out. I didn't like jump to a towel and jump to that like, oh my God, I'm so cold. You're good. Just keep breathing. You're good. I slept that night like the only thing I can think of is like a pregnancy nap. I don't know about you, but when I was pregnant, oh my God, the naps were the best. I'd have like two hour nap where I went to the ether. It was crazy good sleep. Maybe you didn't have that, but that's what I compare it to. I'd say sleep like a baby, but they sleep like crap. Anyway, I slept so good. My body felt so good. My knee felt amazing. And when I woke up the next morning and went for my walk with Maverick, I don't know how to describe the happiness. It wasn't just happy. It wasn't just gratitude. It was like another spiritual plane. I was happy in my bones, like a deep, deep, deep happiness. So anyway, I am an addict and I am cold plunging every night because it's been so remarkable. So if you are so inclined, I really encourage the cold plunge. I had no idea it would be so transformative. All right. Those are my personal stories. Let's move on to some parenting stuff. A mama had written me about attachment styles and, you know, she had sort of pegged her attachment style and her husband's attachment style. And she was wondering if her child could have a different attachment style based on the parental attachment styles. And I said, sure. We all attach to people differently depending on what they bring to the table and what we bring to the table. But I did want to open up the conversation about attachment styles in case you're unaware of it or in case there's some confusion. So attachment styles are used in psychology. It's usually how you relate to your partner, your romantic partner, your intimate partner, your life partner, but it applies to everybody. It applies to friends. It applies to our kids. And I know for certain you guys followed the drama. If you're new here, maybe you haven't gotten to those podcasts yet, but last year, right? 2000, oh my God, no. It was 2020. I had a huge breakup with my best friend at the time. And I can look back and see how like attachment styles, again, we can get really enmeshed with another person who has a different attachment style and it can go wonky. And I can see how certain people activate a different attachment style in me. So I'm going to read off the attachment styles. And you can, if you just Google attachment styles, you can pull up a whole bunch of uh, images and graphics on it. I'm going to choose one that I thought was the most appropriate. There's all different kinds of flavors to these, but generally speaking, they're, they're all the same. And we all have different flavors of these depending on our childhood wounds, depending on our trauma, depending on how we approach life. So the first is a secure attachment. And so a secure attachment is obviously probably the best and it contains these features. You can trust fairly easily, is attuned to emotions, can communicate upsets directly leads with cooperative and flexible behavior in relationships. So I think we could say that's the gold standard of attachment styles. And I can directly attest to, like, it's possible to get there. I did not have secure attachment. And through therapy and work and all my personal work and all my spiritual work, I feel confident that 98% of the time I present with a secure attachment. The next is anxious. Anxious attachment style 
has a very sensitive nervous system. Just anything rattles them. They struggle to communicate needs directly. They tend to act out when triggered, i.e. make partner jealous. So they do these things that aren't communicating directly, but just like a toddler, they don't have the words. They haven't grappled with the emotional maturity to communicate needs directly or with the appropriate emotional language. So they act it out, right? And we talk about that even toddlers are really famous for acting out because because they have to be... (laughs) The next style is avoidant dismissive. And this attachment style downplays the importance of relationships, is usually extremely reliant, and they can become more vulnerable when triggered. Yeah. The next one is avoidant fearful. And that is more dependent in relationships than the avoidant dismissive. They strongly fear rejection. They have low self-esteem and they have high anxiety. So those are the four styles. I would say like in my experience, avoidant, fearful too, is the kind of person who is much more dependent. They fear rejection, right? And so they are constantly fearing abandonment, constantly on edge that you're going to leave. And so those are the general four styles of attachment. Now, what's tricky is we all exhibit symptoms of all of these. Yeah, it's it's like... um. It's like narcissism, like we all have some kind of shade within us. And so I would say too, like if you're secure, you can be secure. If you grew up with a secure attachment, God love you. Your parents did a wonderful job. That's awesome. Most of us work to get to a secure attachment style. But then again, you know, you fall in love with somebody who is avoidant dismissive or anxious, and it's going to trigger something within you. And you may not be able to be as secure. And what I generally see in my work with couples is that one person has worked really hard to get that secure attachment and the other person maybe hasn't done their work. And that's where some conflict starts to come in, right? Because the person who hasn't done their work still presents with these like, you know, maybe high anxiety, maybe fearful of abandonment. And the person who's secure kind of has to hold down the fort while the other person is a whirlwind around them. What I have found is that everybody wants a secure attachment for their child. Yes, we know it's healthy. Even if you were unfamiliar with these four categories, we know the term secure attachment, right? We want our child to feel secure in the world. And even if you are anxious, even if you're avoidant dismissive, it doesn't necessarily mean that your child is going to be that. What I find is that there's an overcompensation. And more often than not, What happens is we work really hard to become secure in our relationships, have that secure attachment, right? So that we trust fairly easily, we're attuned to emotion, we can communicate directly, and we lead with cooperative and flexible behavior. We work really hard for that. And so we know the value. And so what happens is we really want this for our kids. So we overcompensate. And I find this most often again, in the category of parent who probably had a different attachment style, did some personal work, worked through therapy, learned how to attach securely, right, (laughs) in their relationships. And that's where I am in my life is I find like I've worked really hard to get to this point and I'm really proud of it. And then I get irritated. I might go out on a date and I'm like, it's so clear to me the other person hasn't done their work. And I'm not interested at 53, if you haven't done your work, I'm not interested. But for you guys, maybe you got married in your early 20s and now one person has done the work to become secure and the other person hasn't. So you start raising a kid. Now your kid is going to attach differently to each parent no matter what. And unfortunately, dads, I'm sorry to say this, but it's true. Most kids in the early years attach to mom much more securely than dad. It's biology, it's the bond, it's what happens. And then oftentimes the kids attach to dad more securely in the preteen, eight, nine, 10. I feel like dads almost don't necessarily know what to do in the younger ages. Or if mom's nursing, there's this like real intimate bond that happens. And dad kind of is like, oh, I'll just wait over here until you guys are all set. That's a generalization. I know dads, especially dads listening to this, are super involved in their kids' lives. But don't be upset if your kid is, you know, more securely attached to mom than to you at this point in time. It often changes. And then mom gets pissed. (laughs) 
I think what gets tricky when we talk about the attachment styles is that you have your own, your spouse has your own, you have your own styles with different people. And then now you have your kid and you're like, well, how do I get this secure attachment? And again, I see a overcompensation, a sort of like, I'm going to make this secure. And it reminds me of all our talk about regulation and helping somebody self-regulate, which I maintain you can't do. You can co-regulate, but you can't help someone self-regulate. And what I find is that parents are like, I can, I'm going to make this happen. And that is an overcompensation. So how- Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place It's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. How you form a secure attachment with your child. Now, of course, there's a whole bunch of literature on how to do that, like the first year. And that's where attachment parenting came from, right? Is the secure attachment model. But attachment parenting really was written for the first 12 months of life. And so I, when people contact me and they're like, I have a four-year-old and we're doing attachment parenting, I'm like, eh, the attachment parenting model as, and as a philosophy is really for infants. When we get into the toddler years, we do want to cultivate a secure attachment, but it requires something different. And the big thing that it requires is both freedom and support, Okay. I have to say this again and again and again, you guys, because we go through this with like sort of the gentle parenting model, complete availability to your child at all times and complete honoring of every single feeling that comes out of that child. When I say honoring, I mean, stop everything. Let's attend to this feeling. That is not secure attachment. In fact, you're going to have a child who becomes too dependent on you. Okay. A secure attachment is a fine balance between freedom and support. You want your child to know they have your support, they have your love, but we also have to give them freedom to explore. And this becomes tricky because we have helicopter parenting, which is a whole nother ball of wax. But what happens is we get so concerned about safety. We get so concerned. Now we have COVID to deal with that we hover. And we want to make sure the child's okay. We rescue, you know, and of course your kids are very little. My kid's much bigger. But, you know, once your kid gets to be like five, six, seven years old, they have to start tracking their belongings, right? So we rescue them. A lot of schools have instituted a no rescue policy. If your kid forgets their lunch, their homework, their mittens, you don't get to come to school and bring it. They have to deal with the consequences because we've provided such a safety net. And I think it comes out of this sincere desire to have secure attachment for your child to know that you're there for them, right? That's not what secure attachment is. That's creating entitlement. That's creating dependence. Support is like, yeah, you got this. Yeah, go ahead. You can go down the slide, right? It's not cheerleading. It's not, you can do it. It's not, oh my God, get off the top of the slide. You're going to fall, right? It's a quiet knowing that your child is capable. So there's that freedom. You got to let them go. You got to let them explore. I just saw a great meme. Um, Somebody said, I can't let my kid outside because they'll eat the dirt. And the mom was like, I let my kid eat dirt. I mean, eventually they're not going to like dirt. And dirt is actually pretty good for the immune system if it's not, you know, in a gross city park or something. (laughs) But um, it's really, it's being present. So the biggest thing that you can do to form a secure attachment, to assure that your child grows up with a secure attachment in their relationships is to do your fucking work. And I'm going to say this again and again. If you have trauma, if you know that you are anxious, it's not okay. It's not okay to have these other attachment styles and say, oh, but that's how I am. Do your work because we're all striving for the secure attachment. Mostly, I feel like the biggest thing is that communicates upsets directly. All the problems I see, because I work with kids, I naturally work with their parents. And sometimes my work edges into like marriage counseling, but it always comes from somebody unable to express that they're upset. And that comes out of, and I can see this in my own friendships that have blown up, 
I haven't been able to express myself because I've been fearful that the person will leave and leave Pascal's friendships, right? I, I talked about that with Ava, my my old friend, is I felt locked into a relationship. I couldn't respond authentically because I was afraid not just of abandonment, like the psychological abandonment of a friend, but Pascal was locked into friendships with her kids and I didn't want that to be jeopardized. So I got stuck in being like avoidant, fearful because of the situation of what I perceived the situation to be. So it's one of those things that, you know, you can get caught in these things that are momentary, even if you do feel like you're generally speaking, a securely attached person. But again, all the difficulties I see is when somebody can't communicate that they're upset. And sometimes that's because the person you're dealing with is very difficult and will blow up or whatever. You know, there's ramifications for that. But if we could all just really calmly say, hey, I'm upset about this. And the other person says, oh, I, I didn't know I made a mistake or, hey, can we talk about this? If we could just talk about it all, then that would eliminate so many problems. So we're striving for the secure and you want your child to have that secure. If you don't do your work, you will be modeling one of the other styles or you will be overcompensating and you will be trying to layer a secure attachment onto your child into an existing paradigm, which is just going to fuck up the kid. It just will. You can't just like try to put something. It's like putting a bandaid over a, a gaping wound. You can't do that. So do your work, you guys, like seriously. And on that note, I just got in the mail. I don't know if you guys follow the holistic psychologist on Facebook. Her name's Dr. Nicole LaPera, and she has a great book called How to Do the Work. Recognize your patterns, heal from your past and create yourself. I highly recommend it. I've read clips from other people's books, so I finally ordered it for myself. I have done a shit ton of work and I'm still doing more because I always just want to be a better communicator. I want to be more authentic. And I keep finding that the more authentic I am with Pascal, the better our relationship. So that's the best thing you can do. If you look at these attachment styles and dive into it a little bit and you go, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me. There's ways to change it. You know, you can contact me or a therapist or marriage counselor or whatever. I'm happy to help. It's just very important that you clear your slate so that you don't hand it to your child, right? And think about it. If you're with somebody who is avoidant dismissive, you downplay the importance of relationships, you're super self-reliant, I don't need you, I don't need you, your kid is going to be like that, right? It's the modeling. Remember, they don't do what we say, they do what we do. The other thing about a secure relationship is fights happen, conflict happens, it really does. And it's so funny. I was just talking to a friend and I was talking about like first dates for me. And I'm always like, how do you handle conflict? And it's so funny because very often the other person doesn't want to talk about that. He's usually like, what? Like being in love is easy. Good sex is easy. The honeymoon phase is easy. You know what's hard? When the shit hits the fan, how do you handle conflict, right? How do you communicate your needs? Do you blow up? Do you act out? Do you just walk away? How do you handle that conflict? Remember, connection ruptures happen all the time. The idea is not to have a steady connection with your child that is never ruptured. That's impossible. We're human. You're going to have connection ruptures. What has to be second nature is the repair. How do you repair the connection? And that's what's key with our kids. And that kids are so forgiving. It's so easy to repair connections with our kids because they're like Maverick. They forgot about the issue and now they're ready to just be on your lap and pet them. <laughs> so it's as simple as I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry. We lost our way. I really suggest that you guys get used to using the words connected and disconnected. It will serve your child. It will serve your family. It will serve your household when you can use those actual words. And it brings some real emotional wisdom to your child, some real good emotional language. I'm feeling disconnected. Imagine your child saying that instead of throwing a fit. Wouldn't that be great? So start using those words very early on, even when they're real little. You can tell them, I feel so disconnected from you. Come on, let's connect. Eye contact. That is the most important thing with connection. 
eye contact. I'm hearing from a lot of clients about kids who just endlessly want to play with their parents. They're just not getting full. Their connection bucket's not full. And we go through the day and the problem with connection with our kids is we do everything for our kids. Every freaking thing you do in a day, your kid is on your mind. It's for your kid or it's for the family. Even if you're doing self-care, it's so that you can recharge and be a better parent. But what happens is we start doing that and we think we've connected because our kids are on our mind all day. You have to hit those connection points. I talk about this in Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. It may be 10 minutes every hour. It might be 20 minutes every four hours. It has to be a couple of times a day and it has to be super concrete bouillon cube of connection. It can be playing. It can be eye contact. It can be touching, massage, rubbing their back, rubbing their hair. Kids love touch. And especially now in COVID, we're not getting touched a lot from other people. So you got to kind of over touch, you know what I mean? Like rub their arms, rub their back. And that's an awesome way to repair a connection. Sometimes it's just like, Hey, I'm sorry. I went crazy there for a second. I'm super sorry. Can we have some connection time? But the more you use connect and disconnect, you'll give your child the language to use in the future so that they don't have to do that acting out. Imagine if we could even say that with our friends or with our spouses. It's like, you know, I see so much inviting at the end of the day. Ah, da, da, you did this, ah, you did that. And there's so much like just bickering and inviting. And imagine if you could say, I missed you today. I feel very disconnected. We both landed at home at the same time. Dinner's got to get made. The kids are a clusterfuck. I'm disconnected from you. And you could take two minutes to connect. Like, that's so great. Instead of this mishmash of acting out and being snide and offhanded comments and under the breath, right? That And then we get into this, this passive aggressive nonsense. And that's where shit goes wrong. So connection ruptures happen all the time. It is not the goal to have a seamless connection with your kid. The goal is get really good at repairing. All right, on that note, getting really good at repairing connections with friends, with spouses, with our kids. I've gone through this before, but it really warrants as part of this conversation, but also just in general, I feel like we can't talk about this enough, which is what makes a good apology? Because I see a lot of shitty apologizing. (laughs) And I'm really working on this with Pascal for some reason. I might model this occasionally, but generally speaking, I don't model this. So there's definitely nature versus nurture, but he gets super defensive. But Pascal, I've I've mentioned this before. He came into the world with a certain amount of shame and guilt that he was born with. All I had to do was look at that kid cross-eyed and he'd be like, don't yell at me. I was like, I didn't even utter a word. (laughs) Like Super sensitive. I had to be very gentle in my disciplining and when I had to correct or reprimand because he was ultra sensitive to that. But now as a teenager, how that manifests is a very quick defense, a very quick, uh uh-uh, not me. I didn't. So I'm really going over this with him. And again, I think you can't talk about this enough. What makes a good apology? Number one, I can guarantee if you're anywhere near my age, do not look to your parents as role models. They are the shittiest role models for apologizing. At least the parents I know and those of my friends. (laughs) Our parents usually model defensiveness. I don't know about your parents, but my parents have nowhere near done any personal work. So it makes sense that they would be defensive and shame-filled. A good apology is simply saying, I'm sorry. So if somebody comes to you and says, I feel disconnected, I feel angry, I feel sad, you hurt my feelings. The very first thing is, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry. Not, well, you, well, you, (laughs) but you did not that, right? I'm sorry. It really wasn't my intention to hurt your feeling or better yet. I'm sorry. It was my intention to hurt your feeling. I lashed out and I apologize. I got to get my shit under control. Imagine saying that to your spouse. (laughs) You apologize and you repeat back. I'm sorry. I hurt your feelings. Not I'm sorry. You feel that way. That is the shittiest apology known to man. Oh, I'm sorry. You feel that way. That is the most passive aggressive backhanded nonsense I ever did hear. And when somebody does it to me, I nearly go off on them. And then I'd have to be really sorry. (laughs) So not, I'm sorry. You're feeling that way. 
I'm sorry, I hurt your feelings. It wasn't my intention. And this, of course, is probably with grownups as opposed to kids. Although with kids, I think it it repairs the connection. However, we do get with our littles, they start twisting things around, right? You reprimand them, they cry because you hurt their feelings, <laughs> right? That old trick that happens. In that case, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that your feelings are hurt. And let's talk about the thing that you did wrong. And then we can talk about your feelings. Yeah. So, but generally speaking for grownups, I'm talking about, I'm sorry, I hurt your feelings. It wasn't my intention. And then if they hear that and it lands, then you say, can I explain where I was coming from? And you have to be willing to let them say no. Hopefully they'll say yes. So you can have a dialogue because oftentimes we're just human we bump into each other, our stuff leaks out, our wounds get leaky and pussy. And sometimes we just need to explain, you know? And oftentimes I find these are the best dialogues when I have been with people who, for whom it lands and we can have a dialogue. I'll say, you know, I reacted to the noise in the room. It triggered me. Or I reacted to, you said something two sentences ago and I reacted to that and I'm working on it. I let it simmer. I should have said something. I should have said something directly about the thing you said two minutes. You know, you can talk about it, but you must ask permission after you apologize. If the other person isn't ready, that's okay. You can have a dialogue later. Yeah. Because I find that what happens, especially in friendships, I think, or even marriages and, and relationships, it's this like snowball effect. Somebody hurts your feelings one day. You don't say anything. Then two days later, they say something else, and then you outburst because of the thing two days ago when you should have said it two days ago. So it's not really their fault. You let it simmer, but it's this steamroll effect. And that's, God, that shit was going on with my sister forever. And I really committed to like, okay, when I'm upset in the moment, I need to stop and say it. The other person may not hear it. It may not land. I may not get an apology, but I need to say it so that I don't end up with this rat's nest after a couple of months that you're trying to like pull apart, right? If you get shameful and defensive, parents, you need to hear this because you need to get your shit together as parents. If one of you apologizes to the other and the other one gets defensive, you have just modeled for your child how to handle shame, guilt, all of those things. It's unbearable for some people to think that they did something wrong. And so those defenses go up and it can be super like shameful. And that's where you go like, no, -uh, no. -uh. <laughs> and so you're modeling that for your child. Your child is watching you guys and that's forming their idea of what a relationship is. It's not that you have to walk on tender hooks all the time. You don't. You don't have to present as perfect all the time, especially if it's inauthentic. But you do have to model what a good apology looks like. You do have to model how to have it land so that you can say, I'm sorry, so that you're not defensive. Those are the things that become really important that your child sees and that you model. If you feel yourself getting shameful and defensive and somebody says, you hurt my feelings, you say, oh my goodness, I hear you. Give me one second. Admit it. I'm feeling shame. I'm feeling defensive. I'm not sure why. Hold on. Okay, I'm so sorry. Because largely when we hurt somebody's feelings, we have been triggered and we did hurt their feelings, right? Like we were sharp or we said something scathing or whatever it is. So then you take that second, you go, okay, no, you're right, you know, or I'm sorry. Again, if you make it a habit for the first thing out of your mouth to be, I'm sorry, and then let the situation unfold. I think what makes a good apology is like simple. I think the more intriguing thing is what makes a bad apology, right? This one drives me nuts. Hey, you know, it made me really uncomfortable the way you talked to me just now, like you were treating me like a child, Oh yeah? Well, you treat everybody like a child. You treated me like a child last week. No, I'm talking about me now. So that is a very common theme that I've seen in people in my life is, you know, as I've committed to being more authentic and more direct, the other person wants to talk about what I did six months ago. And I'm like, okay, we can talk about that, but we're not talking about that now. What we're talking about now is what just happened. And so don't let people sidetrack you, but be conscious that you don't do this yourself, right? Because that is the impetus. Shame is the most powerful feeling. It is the most powerful deflector. When we feel shame, our ego, our outside will do 
anything to protect that inside. No, 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 I didn't. No, I wasn't a bad person. Listen, we all fuck up. We're all bad people. We all have bad thoughts. We all have bad shit come out of our mouths when we're angry or triggered or upset. So know that, but you're not a bad person, right? Just like we tell our kids, your behavior's bad, but you're not a bad person. (laughs) But the way we hear it, and depending again on our trauma, our wounds, we come out swinging because, oh my God, we don't want to feel that. So is it any wonder when our kids, when we get angry with our kids, when we reprimand our kids, even in the calmest of moments that our kids feel that bucket of shame and they're like, wow, they go through the roof, right? So that's their version of being defensive. So that's another thing to avoid is really, really sit with, I did something wrong and, and look at it this way. This person loves me enough to say it. When somebody tells me that I hurt their feelings, it's such a compliment because they want the relationship to stay alive. They want to work through it. They want an apology. Yes. But also they care enough. If they didn't care, they would swallow it and they would never call me again or they would stop spending time with me, right? So it's a high compliment when somebody lets you know that you did something wrong. I mean, assuming it's not, you know, somebody who just is always telling you what you did wrong and they're kind of toxic, but in a good, healthy relationship, if you do something wrong, it's okay. Yeah, you're not a bad person and it's an honor because that person cares enough to let you know. All right, so that's your good apology. If you have any questions or if you have anything to add, I feel like the art of the apology is a big thing. It's a big can of worms. And if you have any questions on the attachment styles, any comments, anything you want to bring to the table, you guys know I love your feedback. I love your questions. I super appreciate your patronage. And I can't even believe that this podcast went on for 42 minutes. Maybe I'll have to record midday. I feel like I'm a, I'm a little peppier. <laughs> All right, you guys. As always, rock on. I appreciate you. Okay, bye, everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. (laughs) You can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.